All right, I think we can go ahead and get started then. <clears throat> so uh, today we will actually start into the um, physics material for the class. Uh, we've finished up the math review stuff uh, last week. And I think we are ready to get into the thick of things. Uh, the first topic, first big topic we're going to discuss in this uh, course is thermodynamics. Uh, now, obviously, this topic is a very, very widely encompassing. There's um, years and years of study uh, that you could get into for thermodynamics. In fact, <laughs> A lot of times uh, the subject's actually called statistical mechanics. And the reason being uh, thermodynamics, generally speaking, deals with fluids or gases or liquids or things like this. And um, how the molecules, which make up that fluid, and I use the term fluid because in physics, fluid means liquid or gas. And so generally, when you talk about thermodynamics, you think of a gas, like an ideal gas. But just to give a single name to it, it's called a fluid. And so you generally are talking about how the molecules which make up that fluid uh, interact with each other. And by knowing the behavior of the molecules, then you know how the fluid itself will act. What will its temperature be? Uh, how will it expand? What will the pressure be? And things like this. Now, molecules are very small, we all know that. And so if you have a sufficient amount of whatever fluid it is you're talking about, that means you have millions and millions and millions of molecules. And so uh, it's difficult enough to try to keep track of a single molecule and how it interacts, that would be uh, quantum mechanics much less trying to figure out how a single molecule interacts with a second molecule. Um, and then to physics itself, something called the three body problem is the fact that even if you only had three objects, so let's say you're an astrophysicist and you're trying to look out into space and figure out the orbits of the planets very, very, very particularly. Well, it's actually nearly impossible to straightforward theoretically calculate the interactions between three different bodies, three different planets, let's say. It's such a complicated system to try to do. So if we can't even do three, how in the world do we do millions and millions of molecules interacting? And so what's usually done is when you have large numbers of things, you average things out, you use statistics. And you say, yes, technically, I don't know what happens to any one individual molecule specifically, but I know that the, the average effect over all, all the molecules make things work this way. And so that's why sometimes you see thermodynamics referred to as statistical mechanics, because there's a lot of statistics to try to figure out how a bulk object will work instead of looking actually at each individual molecule themselves. It's a very highly mathematical topic. Uh, you get into differential equations and calculus very quickly, um, and it's not the easiest thing to do. Now, it's one of the most important parts of physics. It's very, very fundamental to the nature of how things work. But uh, for the most part, you don't really get into true thermodynamics, statistical mechanics until you're going into advanced physics, graduate school, things like this. For our purposes, there is a lower level of thermodynamics, which still isn't the easiest thing in the world to do, but at least it allows us to get a good grasp of the majority of the way things work. Yes, it's not perfect, 
but it gets us most of the way there, at least for our purposes, for the things we do in our everyday lives, it's more than sufficient. And you could say the same about first semester physics too. When we talk about mechanics, Newton's laws and uh, kinematics and things like this, it's not perfect. You know, we leave a lot of things out like friction, unless we talk about friction or drag forces, air resistance, or all sorts of things. We do a simplified version as a model, which gives us, you know, 90% accuracy. And then depending on how accurate we actually have to be, we can add more and more complication to it to get better and better results. Same is going to go here for thermodynamics. We're going to look at thermo at a higher level, more applied rather than theoretical, because that's what's most useful uh, for the vast majority of us. Um, if you're going to get into the realm of theoretical physics, uh, then of course, later on in your academic career, you get more and more courses on these topics. Now, uh, for those of you that are chemists or chemistry majors, of course, thermodynamics is a very, very important subject to you. And I'm sure you've probably already talked about a lot of thermodynamics in your chemistry courses, even general chemistry and things like this. Things like the ideal gas law, for instance, or entropy or uh, enthalpy and things like this. We're going to talk about that as well. And um, while the physics of it is the same for both, uh, some of the details may be slightly different. For instance, it's my experience that in general, a chemist uses different units than a physicist. Uh, and that's because uh, the realm of importance for chemistry is different than what may be important to a physicist. A chemist is looking at, you know, actual items. Uh, maybe you're talking about a, an actual container of gas or how much energy is provided by a certain piece of food or things like this. And so you will, or chemists will use those units which are typical for the sizes or the whatever of that realm. Whereas a physicist will use uh, what's either more mathematically convenient or what's more important for the more theoretical realm. And a big, big thing here is uh, one of the first um, characteristics you need to know, which is called heat. So heat has the variable capital Q. <coughs> And the units we use in physics is capital J or joules. Now you should remember joules because um, if you had first semester physics, general physics one, then you know joules is the unit of energy. So when in first semester physics, we talk about conservation of energy, kinetic and potential energy, those things had units of joules. And it turns out heat is a form of energy. Just like when we talked about conservation of energy, energy comes in different types. You have kinetic, which is the energy because you're moving. You can have different forms of potential. So maybe the fact that you're lifted a certain distance above the ground means stored within you is gravitational potential energy. Some amount of energy that can be used or transformed into kinetic. If someone drops you from a height, you start to move down and get faster and faster as you get closer to the ground. Potential is turned into kinetic. Or electric potential energy. Because you move two electric charges closer and closer to each other, let's say two protons, they want to repel. And so there's some energy, some potential energy that makes them want to shoot away from each other due to their charges. Well, heat is just another form of energy. However, what you'll find a lot of times in chemistry is they'll use calories as their units of energy. It's just a different system. Just like physicists use meters for distance, whereas an engineer in the United States will use feet for distance, feet and inches and yards and things. 
they're both a unit of distance. They're both true and accurate and you could use them, but the numerical constants that you start to find in your equations will be different based on what units you use. Big example, uh, in uh, a physicist's world, G, the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, approximated. But to an engineer, an American engineer is 32 feet per second squared. So because they use a different unit of distance, feet instead of meters, their uh, unit of acceleration due to gravity has to be a different number. But the equations, for instance, force is mass times acceleration, or weight is m times g, is still true. It's just that instead of multiplying by 9.8, you multiply by 32, and you get pounds instead of newtons. Okay? So don't let uh, this difference in units confuse you. In this class, we're using the physicists' units, which are joules. Also, what you'll find is we use uh, what's called um, MKS units, which means meters, kilograms, seconds. Those are our big three fundamental units. And a lot of times, uh, uh, a chemist will use CGS which is centimeters, grams, and seconds. So again, you will find different units depending on what subject matter you're studying. The equations will be the same equations, but numbers might be different. And I'll show you an example as we get to it later. But for us, we're using joules. So heat, a form of energy stored within uh, a molecule or an atom or whatever it is we're studying. Another thing we need to know, of course, is temperature. That's a big one for thermodynamics, obviously. And this one is not so easy to define. Temperature is actually very difficult to define, even though I can ask any one of you uh, if you know what temperature is, and you would all have an idea of what temperature is. I say, what's the temperature outside? Everybody knows. Um, how to find it. You either get a thermometer, you look it up, whatever the case. And we understand the difference between 48 degrees outside versus 98 degrees outside. One is cold, one is hot. However, to actually define temperature accurately that works in all cases is a difficult concept. What we usually find is uh, People will generally say uh, temperature is a, a measure of how much heat energy is stored within an object. That's not a good definition. Um, because one is an energy, one is a temperature. They're two different things. And uh, measuring the temperature is not necessarily measuring the energy. Another thing people will say is it's uh, how much kinetic energy the molecule has. So for instance, one way of thinking about something being hot, let's say you have a gas. Well, it's hot because the molecules of the gas are vibrating very quickly. They have a lot of energy, so they move fast, thus they have high kinetic energy. And they start to vibrate and collide with other materials. So if you go touch something that's hot, the molecules in the hot object are vibrating very, very strongly, collide with the molecules in your fingers. They give off some of that energy in the collision to your fingers. And so energy is transferred to your hand and you feel it. And thus you feel the temperature of the object. Um, that's a pretty good definition and it works for a lot of cases, but it's not perfect. And here's why. Um, if I were to ask, is outer space, okay, so you leave the atmosphere of the earth and now you're in space. Is it cold or is it hot? Well, I think the vast majority of people, if not everybody, has the concept that space is very cold. If you put something out in outer space, it freezes, which is true. However, 
Uh, if we think about the definition of temperature being the kind of a measure of how much kinetic energy an object has, well, one thing you have to realize about space is the molecule space is not perfectly empty. It's not a perfect vacuum. There are some molecules of gas flowing through it. It's just more vacuum than the earth or less dense, let's say. Well, the molecules which are coming off the sun, gas is being expelled from the sun all the time. Uh, it's called solar wind. That gas flows through space. Even way, way far away from the sun, those gas molecules are moving very, very quickly. So if you go measure the kinetic energy of the gas molecules coming off the sun, it's a very high kinetic energy. Thus, because every molecule of gas, if you were to get a thermometer and measure it, every uh, molecule of gas hitting the thermometer is highly, highly kinetic energy. That would mean that gas is very hot. But we know if we put something out in outer space, even though that hot gas is hitting it, it freezes. So there's a disconnect here. Space is cold, yet if we define temperature as the measure of the kinetic energy of the gas, well, the gas in space is very, very highly kinetic energy. So it should be hot. So this definition doesn't work perfectly either. And in fact, the reason it's cold instead of hot is because while the gas is moving very quickly and has high kinetic energy, there's very few particles of gas there. So yes, when one particle hits you, it hits you really hard, but it's rarely ever hitting you because there's not that many uh, molecules of gas in space. So each one hits you hard, but you rarely ever feel it. So temperature, difficult. For our purposes, it's fine to think of temperature being a measure of the kinetic energy. It's more than enough for what we're gonna do. But no, if you get into this topic, that's not sufficient and you have to think about temperature in different ways, depending on what you're doing. What is the variable? Of course, it's capital T, that's nice, easy. It makes a lot more sense than capital Q be heat. What the heck does Q have to do with heat? T is temperature, fine. What are the units of temperature? Well, I already know here in the world, there's different units of temperature. In the United States, we use Fahrenheit. In fact, we use degrees Fahrenheit. And not just the United States, other countries use it as well. Um, other countries use a different unit. They use degrees Celsius, or in my dad's day, they called it centigrade, but now it's called Celsius. So we have degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius are the two most common uh, units or scales of temperature that we have here. And neither of them is what we use in physics. Turns out that what we use is Kelvin. Capital K, Kelvin. Now, first thing, which is just a, a note to, to understand is it's not degrees Kelvin, okay? It's degrees Celsius. So you'd say, how hot is that boiling water? It's hundred degrees Celsius. If you ask how hot is it in Kelvin, you'd say it's 373 Kelvin. You don't say degrees Kelvin. Why? I don't know. You just don't. It's Kelvin. So one thing we're going to want to do is figure out, well, if we know the temperature in one scale, how can we figure out the temperature in a different scale? Because maybe I want to do some problems around the house and I go look at the thermometer and the thermometer says it's 50 degrees Fahrenheit outside, but I wanna use my physics equations and they require me to use Kelvin. How do I get from Fahrenheit to Kelvin? Under the assumption that I don't have internet and look it up on my phone or something. Well, I'll show you. It's actually fairly easy. The conversion factor, let's say you want to get um, Fahrenheit knowing 
Celsius. So if you know the temperature in Celsius, how can you get Fahrenheit from it? Well, it turns out all you do is you take the temperature in Celsius, multiply it by a number. What number? Nine over five. Then after you do that, you add 32 to it. And that's the conversion. You wanna know what the temperature in Fahrenheit is. So you're talking to a friend over in Germany. They say, hey, it's uh, 33 degrees Celsius uh, over here. And uh, you say, okay, well, what the heck is 33 Celsius? Is that hot? Is that cold? What the heck is it? Well, if you wanna know, then take the 33, multiply it by nine over five, and then add 32 to that number. And now you know what it is in Fahrenheit. Very easy conversion factor. And let's prove that it's true. Because I happen to know a few pieces of information. I know that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. And I know, living in America my whole life, that water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I plug in zero, for the temperature in Celsius, then the temperature in Fahrenheit better come out to be 32. So what do I do? Zero is Celsius, I'm gonna multiply it by nine over five and add 32 to that number. And what do I get? Of course, that's just zero. So I get 32 degrees. And there we go, perfect. Given a temperature in Celsius, I calculated Fahrenheit and it came out to what I think it should be. Another one, Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So if I have 100 for my Celsius, I'm gonna multiply that by nine over five and add 32. So what is that? 900 over five plus 32. 900 over five is uh, 180. 180 plus 32 is 212, which I happen to know is indeed the boiling point of water in Fahrenheit. So it checks out. And any temperature you choose uh, will work this way. You tell me Celsius, I could give you Fahrenheit by doing this little calculation. What if I wanna go the other way? What if I know Fahrenheit and I wanna tell my buddy in Germany what the, tell, what the temperature would be uh, uh, Celsius? Well, take this equation, it's just algebra, and solve for C instead of F. So you say, okay, well, if this is my equation, F is nine over five times C plus 32, I wanna solve it for C. So I bring the 32 over to the other side, F minus 32 equals nine over five times C. Get rid of the nine over five. So C is equal to five over nine times F minus 32. And there we go. That's how you get from Fahrenheit to Celsius. You tell me Fahrenheit, first thing I do is take away 32 from it. Once I've done that, I multiply that number by five over nine, and I now have the Celsius. Okay. Now I never remember this one. I remember the first one, because that's easier. And then I just do algebra when I wanna figure out what's the other conversion. But that's how you convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. Five over nine, that's about a half. 32 is about 30. So you can do an approximation fairly quickly. It won't be perfect, but it's fairly quick. Or the other way, you multiply Celsius by two and add 30, that's about the conversion. It's not exact, but it's close. All right, fine. Fahrenheit, Celsius, I now know how to do the conversion. Oh, here's a little tip in case you didn't know. There's one temperature where Fahrenheit and Celsius are the same number. Does anybody happen to know what that temperature is? No, sir. No guesses? It turns out that negative 40 Fahrenheit is the same as negative 40 Celsius. It's just a quirk of the system because the size of a degree of Celsius is bigger 
than the size of a degree of Fahrenheit. Meaning if you change by one degree Celsius, you're changing by more than one degree Fahrenheit, okay? So because they don't change exactly the same, at some point that all equals itself out and that point happens to be negative 40. So I remember a long years ago, there was a riddle about, a, I think, um, uh, airplane engineer and he had to fix something on the plane. And a, a, one of the people said, oh yeah, the, the temperature where this piece of material uh, breaks is negative 40. And the question was, uh, why did the uh, airplane engineer know whether this would be fine in Fahrenheit in the United States versus in Europe? And you, all you had to know was, oh, negative 40 Celsius is the same as Fahrenheit. So it doesn't matter. Once you say negative 40, you know it's negative 40. Any other temperature, they're different. Just as you see, zero Celsius is 32 Fahrenheit, or 100 Celsius is 212 Fahrenheit. Every temperature will always differ except for negative 40. Not important, but just a quick fact for trivia. Now, speaking of not important, what is important for this course is neither Celsius nor Fahrenheit, but rather Kelvin, because it's the Kelvin scale we use in physics. And why is that? Why did we invent some new temperature scale? Why don't we just use Celsius? Celsius is fine, or Fahrenheit, whatever. Well, the reason is this. First of all, Fahrenheit, um, he used a temperature scale, which is relative to the normal everyday life of a human being, right? Generally speaking, normal temperatures on earth, I mean, where you live is generally zero to 100. And of course there's extremes, but for the most part, that's the important stuff. So his scale is based on the normal living temperatures. So, excuse me, Celsius, he said, look, uh, why, you know, I'm going to make a different scale. I like the metric system, things, powers of 10 and all of that. So I'm going to make my own scale. Now I have to base it on something because I want the temperature scale to be, you know, zero to hundred is important, but what should I base it on? And so what he said is the most important thing to humanity to human beings or life on this planet really is water. Water is the most important molecule to, to living things. And so what he said is, I'm gonna make my scale so that the low temperature zero is the freezing point of water and the high temperature 100 is the boiling point. And then I'm going to equalize the degrees between them. So the Celsius scale is based on water. Now a physicist, as a physicist, we come along and we say, look, we're talking about the laws of the universe. Okay, we're not talking about the laws of earth or the laws of humanity. That stuff is fine. That's what engineers are for. They talk about stuff that's important to humans. But a physicist is usually more theoretical than that and they're saying, we want to come up with something that's natural to the universe. And water is just one of millions of molecules out there. Who cares about water? Water is just one molecule. Why not hydrogen or helium? What do I care about water for? So a natural scale for the universe should not be based on water, but on something more fundamental. And so Kelvin comes along and he says, look, one thing I don't like about the Celsius scale, I like the whole zero to a hundred. You know, powers of 10 are very easy when we talk about math. The problem is zero is not zero. You can have temperatures lower than zero. You know, all the time you could go outside if you're living up north, let's say, or um, over in Europe, in Russia, you go out and it's negative 20 Celsius. Well, uh, negative is stupid. Why do we have negative temperatures? Let's make 
the lowest temperature possible, zero, because it's zero temperature, and then everything can be above zero. And so Kelvin says, I'm making a fundamental scale such that the lowest possible temperature on my scale is the lowest possible temperature in the universe. And so he says zero on my scale of Kelvin, and that's zero Kelvin, not okay, by the way, is called absolute zero. It is the literal lowest temperature physically possible. Now, I say that, and I know from my own experience, there's research where people have done fancy materials and fancy things with them and have forced materials to uh, act as if they're at a temperature which is actually less than absolute zero. These are very, very highly theoretical, highly uh, rare occurrences for the vast majority of everything you'd ever do, absolute zero is literally the lowest it can be. It can't be lower. So he says, that's gonna be my low point. So there's no such thing as negative temperatures to Kelvin. And then how big should each unit of Kelvin be? Like a Fahrenheit unit, one degree of Fahrenheit is whatever it is. One degree of Celsius is whatever it is. So how big should a unit of Kelvin be? And he said, well, look, Celsius is already working pretty well. So let me just use the size of a degree Celsius as the size of a Kelvin. And so that's what he did. The Kelvin scale literally is the Celsius scale, except reformatted where the zero point is. And what is absolute zero on Celsius? Zero Kelvin happens to be defined as negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, okay? There's no temperature lower than that. That is the lowest possible temperature. So negative 273 Celsius is zero Kelvin. And then from there, it can go up. In fact, uh, if you go up by one degree Celsius, you go up by one Kelvin. And so the conversion, let's say I give you Celsius and you have to give me Kelvin, is very easy. If you want Kelvin, you give me Celsius and you add 273 to it. I'm going to stop writing a 0.15 because who cares? 273. That's it. So if I told you water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, what temperature does it freeze at Kelvin? Zero plus 273 is, it freezes at 273. Very easy. So this important. How to convert from Celsius to Kelvin? Very easy to remember. Whatever the number is in Celsius, add 273 to it, and you have your answer. Of course, if you want to go the other way, we say, if you know Kelvin, what is it in Celsius? Well, it's Kelvin minus 273. You just move the 273 over. And then, there we go. So in physics, every equation that we're going to work with, which involves temperature, requires you to use Kelvin as the, as the uh, scale. So if you're given information that's in Celsius, convert. Now, with that said, and I love when people say that, that being said, or with that said, because it usually means the very next thing they're about to say is the opposite of what they previously said. So you always need to convert to Kelvin. With that said, there are times you don't have to convert if you don't want to. Now, it's important to understand when you can and when you can't do this. What I will say is after I explain it, it's not difficult, but if you're confused about it or you're worried that you're going to make a mistake, always convert. If you convert, you won't get it wrong. 
However, there will be times where you don't have to convert. You could just keep Celsius and it turns out you'll get the same answer anyway. So it's a special, uh, special um, version of the equation. So when do we convert? When do we not? First big rule is always convert. Second rule is if the uh, equation involves the temperature. So for instance, uh, ideal gas law. We've all seen the ideal gas law. Don't worry about what it means yet. We're gonna get to it. But this is one form of it. PV equals nRT. You also PV equals nKT is a different version. P is pressure, V is volume, N is number of moles, R is ideal gas constant, T is temperature. Fine. As I said, we'll get to the topic. I'm just using this as an example. Here we have an equation which involves temperature. So if I wanna, for instance, figure out what's the pressure, I would divide over the volume and I'd plug my numbers in and I'd get my pressure. But notice if I plug in uh, zero degrees Celsius, I'll get one answer, I'll get zero actually. But if instead I use the Kelvin scale, well for the Kelvin scale, K is C plus 273, which is zero plus 273 in this case. So the temperature is actually 273 Kelvin. If I plug 273 in, that's a completely different number. So which one is right? Is zero the correct answer or is the answer with 273 used the correct one? It's the one with 273 because any equation which requires you to use temperature, you must be in Kelvin for physics. Another rule, if instead the equation does not require the temperature itself, but rather the change in temperature, then you could use either one. So for instance, here's a different equation, Q equals CM delta T. Okay, this is calorimetry. This is gonna be the first big topic we do here in thermodynamics. C is called a, a specific heat, M is the mass. Delta T means change in temperature. So what I'm saying is for this, because I'm asking for the change in the temperature rather than the temperature itself, I can use either Kelvin or Celsius and it doesn't matter which one I used. And I'm gonna prove it. Let's say the change in temperature is, I'm going from 10 degrees. So my temperature initial is 10 degrees Celsius, and I'm going to a final temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, okay? So what's delta T? Delta T is defined to be final minus initial, always. So in Celsius, that would be 20 minus 10, which is 10 degrees Celsius change. Now, what would the change be if I converted everything to Kelvin first? Well, I'll do the same thing. I need final minus initial. So what's the final temperature? Well, the final temperature is 20 Celsius, but if I want it in Kelvin, then what do I have to do? I add 273 to that number. Okay, so there's the final temperature. What about the initial temperature? Well, it's 10 degrees Celsius, but I want that in Kelvin, so I have to add 273 to that. So there we go. Final temperature, Celsius plus 273, which is called Kelvin in initial temperature, Celsius plus 273, back Kelvin. And now let's look at what happens. Let's take the parentheses away. I have 20 plus 273, and then a negative goes on to the 10, and the negative goes on to the 273. Well, now we see something nice, positive 273, negative 273, they cancel out. And what's left, 20 minus 10 is 10 Kelvin. And so there we go. In uh, Kelvin 
and in Celsius, a change in temperature is the same number. Thus, if I'm given an equation that wants change in temperature, then I can either convert to Kelvin if I want to, which is actually what you're supposed to do, or leave it in Celsius because the answer will be the same answer anyway. However, as I said, that only works if the equation has delta T. If it's just T, just a pure temperature, then you do have to convert, okay? So that's up to you to decide how you want to use that information. The, what I'm supposed to say as a physics professor is you're always supposed to convert to Kelvin no matter what in every equation you use in physics because that's literally the correct units you're supposed to use. However, I know myself when I'm working these problems, I don't convert to Kelvin if I don't have to because it's an extra step. And I try to avoid doing extra steps if I don't have to. So whenever you see an equation which wants temperature, convert, you have to. When you see an equation which has delta T or change in temperature, then either convert if you'd like or leave it in Celsius. Either way, the number itself will be the same number. All right, any questions so far? No, sir. All righty. So now that we know what scale we need to be in, uh, we can get into the first real topic of thermodynamics. This topic is called calorimetry. Now, as I said, the way we're going to handle thermo in, in this semester is we're going to be more applied. So that is to say more real world type problems rather than the truly purely theoretical, given an ideal gas, four moles um, in a sphere whose radius is 0.2 meters. Tell me what, uh, what should the temperature be if the pressure is 6.1 times 10 to the fifth Pascals? That's a theoretical question. What we're gonna try to do more of is more of the applied stuff. And calorimetry is a field of study, which is a lot more applied. And what it has to do with is, we know how temperature works in general. If you put something hot next to something cold, the hot thing will cool down and the cold thing will heat up. We understand this just by our ordinary everyday lives, even if we're not told that as a theoretical concept in physics. If you're really cold, you turn on your heater, you're gonna warm up. Or if you have a glass of water at room temperature, you put some ice in it, which is very cold, it's gonna make the water turn cold as well. And in doing so, we'll melt some of the ice because it heats the ice up. Now what calorimetry does is it determines this relationship very strongly and allows you to predict very accurately what will be that final temperature. What would happen if, for instance, I got an insulated box, uh, ice chest, and into that ice chest, I put some beverages, let's say a six pack of beer, and um, a big watermelon that's very, very cold out the fridge. And then I close the ice chest and I wait 10 minutes or 20 minutes. And I say, okay, if I go in there and I test the temperature of the beer, I know it should be colder because I put something really cold in there. And I know the watermelon should warm up because the warm beer sucks some of the cold out of the watermelon, let's say. It's the opposite, but let's just say. So the watermelon will warm up, the beers will cool down. What will be their equilibrium temperature? Because they will continue to move heat back and forth with each other until they're at the same temperature. Once they're both at 10 degrees, well, this thing can't get any hotter. This thing can't get any colder. They're, they're at the same temperature. There's nothing else they can do. 
And that's what calorimetry allows us to do. It's an equation or a set of equations, a relationship. If we feed it enough information, it can predict for us what will the inevitable end point be. So what is the big calorimetry equation? Well, in order to do it, we need to know one thing specifically first. And that is uh, each different material uh, requires a different amount of heat to change temperature. And you can see that, uh, for instance, um, well, for instance, think about being in a classroom. Okay, there's a bunch of desks in the classroom. You're gonna sit at a desk. Uh, the desk has a wooden table, a metal bar, which connects the table to the chair and a plastic chair that you're sitting on, okay? And these desks are sitting in the room. The room's air conditioned. So let's say it's 70 degrees uh, and it's sitting there for hours and hours and hours. Then you come into the room, you sit down. Okay, so everything, all, every part of the desk is at 70 degrees. It's all sitting there at 70. Now you touch the different parts of the desk. Let's say you touch the tabletop made of wood and to your hands, it feels a certain temperature. It might be a little colder than you because of course your body's warm. So you feel it and it feels a certain temperature. Then you touch the metal bar and I guarantee you the metal bar feels colder than the tabletop does. Well, why should it feel colder? They're both 70 degrees. So there's something going on here where one type of material does something or feels different than the other, even though the temperature is the same. And this is what's called the specific heat of the material. It turns out that when you put your hand on the wooden tabletop, the material of the wood sucks heat out of your hand. And so it feels cold to you because you're losing heat. How much heat does it suck out? Just enough to warm the table to the same temperature as your hand, okay? So it takes, let's say a hundred joules of energy to do that. So it feels a certain way to, to lose a hundred joules of energy. Then you touch the metal bar instead. <coughs> The metal bar also is going to suck heat out of your fingers until the metal bar is at the same temperature as your fingers. Only this time, the metal is a different material and will take a different amount of energy to do it. Even though it may need to warm the, the material up, let's say 20 degrees, it may take a thousand joules of energy in one material, but only 300 joules of energy in another. And your sensation is one will feel colder, the other won't feel as cold because you didn't lose as much energy. So the specific heat, the variable is little c and it's defined as uh, the amount of energy required to change the temperature of the material uh, and that's exactly one kilogram of the material. So when we talk about things like this, we have to standardize. And so obviously if you have a whole bunch of the material, it's gonna suck a lot more heat and you have a very little bit of the material. So we say, standardizing everything to one kilogram of the material, the amount of energy required to change the temperature of one kilogram of the material by one Kelvin. Or if you're a chemist, one degree Celsius. Okay, that's what specific heat is. One material may take 300 joules to change the temperature of a kilogram of it by one degree. Another material may take 4,186 joules of energy. But each material has a different specific heat. So given a problem, this is probably something given to you in the problem. 
or if you're in a lab and you're doing experiments, you'd look up in a table, what's the specific heat of aluminum? Uh, 300 joules per kilogram Kelvin. All right, what's the specific heat of, uh, of uh, lead or bronze? Each one has a different specific heat. You look it up in a table. So given that, the equation we're going to work with is Q, that is the amount of heat given to the object to change its temperature is equal to C, the specific heat of that object, times M, how much of the object you actually have, times delta T, how much are you trying to change its temperature? Because remember, C is to change one Kelvin in one kilogram of the object. But likely in your actual experiment, you don't have one kilogram of the object, you have something else. And you're probably not just gonna try to change the temperature by one degree, you're probably changing it by 20 degrees or something. So how much energy is required to do this? CM delta T. That's gonna be the big equation we're gonna use here. Now, again, units, very important. Mass is kilograms. Temperature is Kelvin. Now it's delta T, so technically we could use Celsius if we want. And C, C has a stupid unit. It's joules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay. It's the units of C are given by the equation. It's not its own unit. Now, as I said before, chemistry, and I, I mentioned this because a lot of times people in this particular section or in this class are chemists, um, their units are different. The units they will use usually are calories per gram Celsius or sometimes joules per gram Celsius, okay? So you might see these other units, um, which is fine, they work, but you get different answers with those units. For us, we're using joules. So one thing you're gonna see probably if you're a chemist is uh, the specific heat of water is depending on which units they use, kilograms or grams, either a thousand or it's one, but in physics, it's 4,186. And it's purely because the chemist unit uh, specifically manipulates the unit so that water is easy. Water is a thousand, it's very easy to use. But in physicist units, they're talking about the universe, so water is not important. So water just has some random number, okay? So don't be confused if you, when you're doing problems and you're used to your chemistry homework, when you say the specific heat of water, you're using the 1,000. And all of a sudden in physics, you're using 4,186. It's the same thing. It's just ones in calories, ones in joules. We're using joules. All right. Now, this is the equation. However, generally speaking, this is not exactly what we're going to do. It's, we're not going to be asking the question. Uh, you have um, a cup of coffee, 250 grams of water at uh, 20 degrees Celsius. If you want to get it to 80 degrees Celsius to heat it up for coffee, let's say, uh, uh, how much heat do you have to add? That question would be answered by this equation. Okay, That's not what we're going to ask for the vast majority of the time. What we will ask is, I'm gonna put this material, which is at this temperature, and this other material, which is at this other temperature, and his other materials at some other temperature. I'm gonna mix them all around, and it's gonna to come to equilibrium. What will be the final temperature of everything? That's more like the kind of question that we're gonna be trying to solve with calorimetry. So how, how can I do that given that this is the equation I have? Turns out what we're gonna do is we're gonna use one other concept from physics, first semester physics, and that's conservation of energy. Say I have a closed system. So here's the system. 
let's say it's in styrofoam or in an ice chest or something. So heat can't come in from the outside and it can't leave to the outside. Whatever's in here is by itself. And I have one material and another material. Okay. And let's say this guy is very hot. Object one is very hot. Object two is very cold. What's going to happen? Well, physics says that what will happen is the hot guy will give off its energy to the cold guy, reducing the temperature of the hot one and increasing the temperature of the cold one until such time as both objects are at the same temperature. Okay, so energy is transferred from one to the other. The one with more energy gives away the excess energy to the one with less energy until they have the same amount. Not the same amount of energy, really the same temperature. So if this is true, then what I could say is this, they're both gonna get to the same final temperature. Let me rewrite this equation really quick as Cm, and I know delta T stands for final temperature minus initial temperature. That's what it means. So I'm gonna have a Q1, that's how much heat does object one give away. And I'm gonna have a Q2, which is how much heat does object two gain? Okay, object one, has some specific heat, his own mass, and he's gonna go from his original temperature to some final temperature, okay? So that's what his equation would look like. His specific heat, his mass, he gets to a final temperature, whatever it is, and I happen to know his initial temperature was 100 or whatever it is. Now object two, same thing, he's got his specific heat, He's got his mass and what temperatures does he have? He gets to the same final temperature because it's equilibrium, but he started with some other initial temperature. Okay. So object one, how much heat does he lose? That much. Object two, how much heat does he gain? That much. Now the other concept of physics, conservation of energy. If I know nothing can come in and nothing can leave my system because it's a closed system, then what I know about Q1 and Q2 is that whatever Q1 is, he lost 450 joules of energy. Q2 has to gain it. It's got nowhere else to go. If the first object lost this amount, it had to go somewhere. It couldn't leave. So Q2 or object two had to get it. Thus, if I know what Q1 gave and I add to what Q2 gained, this better be equal to zero. <coughs> now it seems weird. You say, wait a second. If I'm adding them, how do they add up to zero? They add to zero because one of these is negative. Q1, he's losing energy. So the energy he gains is lost actually. So he's a negative energy. So Q1 is going to be a negative number. Q2 is a positive number. When I add them together, because they better be the same thing, whatever one lost, two had to get. You add them together, you get zero. So in actual fact, the application of this, if I'm doing an actual problem, what I really have is C1, M1, TF minus T initial one, plus C2, M2, TF minus T initial two is equal to zero. And that's my equation. What would I know in the problem? I would know the specific heat of the objects. One is uh, water and one is ice, or one is water and one is a hot metal cylinder or something. I'd know the masses. How much water do I have? How big is the metal cylinder? Uh, I would know the initial temperatures. 
the water I stuck in was uh, boiling water, so it's at 100 degrees. And the metal cylinder I put in there is at room temperature, 25 degrees. What's the thing I'm looking for? The final temperature. And so that's final temperature. That's the, that's the variable I'll be looking for. And so I'd plug my numbers in and then it's just an algebra problem. Solve for TF. That's the only unknown here. It appears twice, but that's no big deal. You solve for it and you get some final temperature. That's gonna be what we're doing with calorimetry. At least the first part. Calorimetry is split into two halves. This is the first half. And this is two objects or however many objects. I could have 10 different objects in the system. It doesn't have to be two. I would just have one plus two plus three plus four and so on. However many things are in there. Uh, this half of calorimetry says all the things in your system they keep the same state of phase, all right? Or the same state of matter. And all that means is I'm not going to do any uh, a problem where I put ice in the problem where the ice can melt because now I'm going from solid water to liquid water. I'm changing phase, I'm changing the state of phase. Or I'm not, uh, heating up water till it boils and becomes steam. I'm changing phase again. That's the second half of calorimetry. This half is I have hot coffee and I put cold milk in it, okay? Nothing's freezing, nothing's boiling, but I have two different objects at two different temperatures and they're gonna come to equilibrium. Or that's why I did the example with the cold watermelon and the hot beer because if I said ice, the ice can melt. And I wanna avoid that problem for now because we're not doing melting stuff. So I had to have something with a lot of mass and it's very cold. So I use that. So that's gonna be the first set of problems we do with this topic. You're given a system, some number of objects in the system, and you know all the information about all the objects. You're going to set up the equation Basically, every time you're going to have some Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3, dot, 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 as many as you have in your problem, and set it equal to zero. So the big thing for you to be able to do is to read the problem, think about all the pieces that are in my system that are important, and figure out what they all are. And that's your Q1, Q2, Q3. So for instance, let's say it's the hot coffee I have a cup of hot coffee in a styrofoam cup and I put in uh, some cold milk and I'm going to stir it with a metal spoon. Okay. And let's say I have the information for it. Well, when I'm thinking about the problem, I say, okay, I have Q for the coffee because the coffee is going from hot and it's going to cool down when I put the milk in. I'm going to have Q for the milk because when I put the milk in the coffee, the milk is going to warm up due to the hot coffee. And then I'm gonna have Q for the spoon because the spoon is metal, it can change temperature. And I, it was probably room temperature. I stuck it in the hot coffee, the metal spoon is gonna warm up too. So now I have three pieces in my system, set it equal to zero. Each one is CM delta T. Okay. And so at this point, you would say, what is it I'm trying to find? In this problem, I wanna know what's the final temperature. So TF would be the unknown. A different problem could be, if what I want is to take my coffee from 90 degrees Celsius down to 70 degrees Celsius, how much milk should I add? Well, in that case, I know the final temperature, it has to be 70. So the thing I'm looking for is actually the mass of the milk. How much should I add? So it, what thing you're looking for depends on the problem. But no matter what it is you're looking for, this is how you will always set it up. You have a term for each thing in your system. That term is CM delta T. Plug in everything you know. There's going to be one unknown sitting there. Solve for that unknown. 
All right, so that's the theory. Any questions on this so far? All right, well, uh, to leave you in suspense, uh, next time we will uh, do a bunch of examples, okay? I showed you what we're gonna be doing. We didn't do a clear example yet, um, but uh, that's what we're gonna do next time. So uh, I will be posting onto Canvas the material for this topic. So just like I did with the math review, I had the previous lectures posted and the practice problems posted. I'll do the same thing for this, post all the material. Obviously, we've only gone over this one piece. So don't think you're gonna be able to do all the practice problems or anything like that yet. We haven't gotten to it, but it's gonna be there so that whenever you're comfortable with it, you can go and start working practice problems. And of course you could go ahead if it's what you'd like to do and look at the uh, lectures before I get to them uh, in person. But that's what we're going to do. So look out on Canvas for that. I will be uh, doing examples of this next time. Make sure we understand how to physically actually solve the problem. And then we'll talk about the second half of calorimetry, which is called latent heat instead of specific heat. And latent heat is a term that we have to put into here when things can change phase. So if instead of putting in my hot coffee some cold milk, Let's say I don't want milk in my coffee, uh, but I still want to cool it down. So maybe I'll put an ice cube in it. And so the question would be, if I put this much ice and ice melts, uh, what will the final temperature be then? Well, there, if I don't know the second half and all I know is this, I have no way of solving it. I would be completely wrong. I would try to solve it and I'd be wrong um, because the effect of latent heat, the effect of changing phase is very powerful. If you melt ice, that changes temperature a lot more than just uh, cool, you know, cold water trying to cool off a hot coffee. A piece of ice is gonna cool it off way more because the act of melting the ice sucks so much energy out of the system. So it's a very important effect, but let's get to the more simple version first before we worry about that, understand how to do things where there's no change of phase. Then we just add the change of phase in as one extra term and we're good to go. So that's what to look forward to. Other than that, you are of course free to go. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you, have a good one. All right, you Thank too. You. Hello, professor, I had a quick question. Yeah, what's up? <clears throat> I was wondering if you received my email um, in regards to, like I had applied to the photocatalysis opportunity in France for the IRES program that you had sent. Yeah, and yeah. I didn't know if you had received my email or not. I know you haven't been feeling well, but I had requested a letter of recommendation and I wanted to know if you would be able to do it. Yeah, I'll be able to do it. I did, I got it. I didn't read it yet, um, <laughs> but I did get it. I'll read over it and see what's required. Generally, it's usually something like uh, they send a link and I fill out the information on whatever website it is they want uh -huh. or, or they ask for a letter directly, but I'll look at whatever it is. Yeah, I'll be happy to write for you. Thank you very much. Sure. And thank you for class today. Uh, no problem. I'll see you later. Bye -bye. Thank you.